But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and the truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. When we think about the idea of worshiping, worshiping in and of itself, uh, according to the Bible, is distinct. What we learn from verse 23 there in John chapter 4 is the idea that God desires mankind to worship Him. God desires all of us, all of mankind, to worship Him. In fact, Jesus said there in that passage that God is seeking. God is looking for, God desires to find people who will worship Him. But we also learn from that passage that God is not just looking for any kind of worshiper. God is looking for those who will worship Him uh, according to the truth. And in fact, uh, when we look in the Bible, I'm sure all of you are familiar with the fact and the idea that there are at least four different kinds of worship that are are mentioned there in the Scripture. Now, it's not my job or my goal or desire to go over those four different types of worship, but I do want to point out this. The Bible teaches us that three of those types of worship are unacceptable. Three of those types of worship are false or are wrong. There is only one type of worship that we read about in the New Testament that is acceptable to God. That is true worship. And so I want to point out to you as we begin this lesson that the Bible teaches us that there is such a thing as true worship, but it also teaches us that there is such a thing as false worship. And if that be the case, and it is from the Scripture, then we want to focus on preaching, which is an act of worship to God. And so if there is such a thing as true worship and false worship, there is also such a thing as true preaching and false teaching. There are things that are labeled by men in the world today as preaching today that have zero association, that have absolutely nothing to do with true preaching. How can we as Christians today, how can we identify true preaching? What are We're talking about the idea of distinctiveness. What are the, the distinctions? What are the qualities or the characteristics that make true preaching different from false preaching? And so what I want for us to focus upon are four different things this morning uh, that we can identify true preaching by. I mentioned last night that I love to do expository preaching. But this is not an expository sermon. There are times when topical uh, is in order, and I think that's one of these times. But the first thing or the first point that I want to point out to you is that true preaching, distinctive preaching, avoids feuds. Now, you might be reading that and be thinking, now, wait a minute. We're supposed to contend for the faith, right? We're supposed to to stand against uh, gainsayers. We're supposed to stop mouths of false teachers, or at least elders are, and I believe it's all of our responsibility to agree. So what are we talking about avoiding feuds? Well, I'm not talking about the idea of standing up for what's right. I'm not talking about the idea of, of refuting false doctrine, but I'm talking about it from the idea or the standpoint that when we look at Scripture, we look at Scripture as being in harmony with one another. Every passage. We don't look at a verse and and read it and then we turn over here to another place and we say, well, that verse completely contradicts what we just read right there. In fact, we know from the Bible that all Scripture is furthering. That is, that all of it works together. The psalmist says in Psalm 119 and verse 160, at least in the American Standard Version, the sum of thy word is true. What do you have to, to do to get the truth on any given subject? Well, you have to consider everything that the Bible says that God has told us. That word sum, it means you take everything and you add it all together. And when you take everything and you add it all together, then you have the sum of something. And the same is is true whenever we think about any given subject in God's Word. What does the Bible teach on this subject? I can't just turn to one passage and read it and say, well, that's what the Bible teaches. Well, that may be part of what the Bible teaches on that subject, but that's not the whole picture that God has given to us. And to to take one passage and to to isolate it from all the other passages in the Bible, or to take one passage and, and to ignore what the rest of the Bible has to say on any given subject, that's not a good way to study God's Word. 
It's not a, a good uh, way to learn anything from God's Word, and it's a terrible way to preach God's Word. And so when I say that true preaching is distinctive, I'm talking about this idea that when we consider what God has to say in His Word, we consider everything that He has told or revealed to us. Could you imagine as, as a person, if you set out today to read a book, and your job was to summarize that book to somebody else. And what if you just opened up that book and you just read one paragraph in that book? And then you came to that person and you said, let me tell you what this book is all about. Let me tell you the, the plot. Let me tell you the scheme. Let me tell you all the characters that are involved. Let me tell you what happens in the end. Could you do any of those things? I was looking at my Bible this morning as I was thinking about uh, this very point and... A lot of brethren make fun of me for my Bible because it's very small and it's really small print. Uh, the Lord has blessed me that I can still read it thus far. It's getting harder and harder, but uh, my Bible has 863 pages in it. Can you imagine giving a, somebody a book with 863 pages and, they, and then tell them this, I want you to tell me what that book says about salvation. And they open that book and they read to you one sentence out of that book. Here's what this book says about salvation. Would that be an accurate summation of that book? Would that be a good way for anybody to approach that book and to assess what that book is all about? Well, friends, the Bible is no different. We have to read all of what God has to say in order to get the big picture. And of course, one of the great examples, I think, where that is true is when it comes to the matter of salvation. Men ask in the religious world today, what do we have to do to be saved? And there's a majority in, within the religious world to, uh, today who will tell you, I can tell you exactly what you have to do to be saved. All you need to do is read Romans 10, 9 and 10. Right? Because the Bible clearly tells us there that if we believe in our heart that that God raised Jesus from the dead, and if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Christ, then we will be saved, right? Does the Bible say that? Absolutely it does. Read it there in Romans 10, 9 and 10. The problem is this. What happens when you turn over to Luke 13, 3? And Jesus said, Except ye repent, ye shall perish. What do I have to do to be saved? Well, this verse says it all right here, right? Romans 10, 9, and 10. I'm not seeing the whole picture. I look further in God's Word and I see another passage that says, if you don't want to perish, that means if you want to be saved, then this is something you have to do. I turn over to, to Mark chapter 16, 16, and I read the, the words of our Savior. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And it's only when I consider the sum of what God has taught in His Word and revealed to us that I arrive at the truth of any given subject. You see, I could be just as dogmatic as those in the religious world today, and I could just say, well, if you want to know what to be saved, or do to be saved, read Mark 16, 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. That's all you need to know. You just need to believe and be baptized, right? No. Because there are other passages that teach us we need to confess. There are other passages that teach us that we need to repent of our sin. And so when we read something in, in the Scripture, we need to consider everything that God has to say on that particular subject. The second idea that I'll point out to you under this uh, point is, distinctive preaching is going to offer you solutions for difficult passages. They're never, a preacher is never going to look at one passage and read it, then read another passage and say, there's no way you can harmonize those two. That's not true preaching, is it? I have an example up here. An example is, is found in the book of Acts. It's actually about the conversion of Saul. And the reason that I use this is because it's something that we just recently studied in our classes where I, where I preach. So I didn't have to prepare anything for it. <laughs> it makes it a little bit easier. But we, we were talking about this idea. You know, sometimes you read things in one passage and you read another passage, and man, they, they seem like they contradict one another, don't they? You read about the conversion of Saul, or at least his journey on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter 9 and verse 7. And I want to emphasize, remember there's a bright light that appears, all the men see it, all the men fall to the earth, and then Christ speaks to Paul from heaven. And you ever wonder about those guys 
who went who were with Paul there? What what did they think? What was going on with them? Well, in Acts 9 and verse 7, it tells us this. The men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. So we got this passage that tells us these people heard the voice that spoke to Paul, but yet they didn't see anybody. Well, when you turn over to Acts chapter 22 and verse 9, here's again, Paul is speaking. He, he's telling uh, some men what happened to him, how his, uh, these things came to transpire, and he became a Christian. But in Acts 22 and verse 9, he says, They that were with me saw indeed the light and were afraid, but they heard not the voice of him that spake to me. Wait a minute. <laughs> One passage says that they heard a voice, Another passage says that they didn't hear the voice that spoke to Paul. And so some people will say that's a clear-cut contradiction, right? There's no way to get over it. There's no way to overcome it. Not if you believe in distinctive preaching. Because distinctive preaching digs deeper than the surface of every verse. And what the Bible will reveal to us, and I think is the correct answer, of course there's other explanations that could be offered, but I always tell everybody, since I'm the one standing up here, you're going to get to hear mine. <laughs> you may not agree with it, but you're going to have to sit through it. Uh, I believe what, what the answer is to this situation is, it's a, it's a little bit of a mistranslation. Okay, And the reason that I say that, I, whenever I study, it's just my habit and my custom, I, I have electronic books, so it's a little bit easier than using hard copy books. I'm not trying to to down hard copy books in any way. I'm just saying using electronics is a lot faster. But I have 12 different versions that I look at whenever I read. I'm not telling you that's what you should do. I'm not telling you that that's the right thing to do. I'm just telling you what I do. I have 12 different versions. As I, I was reading these verses, sometimes if I come across a difficult passage, I'll look at it in 12 different translations or versions. And sometimes one version will bring out something, or one translation will bring out something that you will say, hey, wait a minute. Maybe that's, this is worth investigating. Maybe this is worth digging into the original languages and looking a little bit further. Maybe there's an easy explanation to these things that, that we're looking at. Well, I bring that up because in Acts 9 and verse 7, eight of those translations or, ver or versions that I use translate it with the idea of them hearing a voice. But there are four other translations that I use that translate it as hearing a sound. And so I thought, hmm, why would you translate that sound instead of voice? And so I started doing a little bit of digging in God's Word, and there were some, some ideas that immediately popped into my mind when it comes to the use of voice, at least in the King James Version. Remember the story in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 8 about Adam and Eve whenever they sin. But in verse 8, the King James Version says this, They heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. You ever heard a voice walking before? Uh, as far as I know, a voice doesn't walk, right? What kind of sound would it make if it did walk? You see, that phrase simply means this. Not that they heard God's voice, but they heard the sound of God walking in the cool of the garden. They heard these footsteps. I don't know what it sounded like, God, God walking in the garden. I can only imagine. But they heard this sound, and they identified this sound with being uh, God coming toward them. You dig a little bit further in the New Testament, and you'll read uh, uh, where this, this original word, this Greek word, phone, we recognize it, we use it for phone in the English language, so it tells you a little bit about some of the relation, the meaning of it. But it can also be translated, and it is translated sometimes in the New Testament as sound. In John chapter 3 and verse 8, Jesus said, The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the phone, the sound thereof. Not the voice. Wind doesn't have a voice, does it? But it does have a sound. In 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 7, Paul talks about the, the pipe and the harp, how they make a sound, phone, the same word that's translated in Acts 9 and verse 7 as voice. Well, a trumpet doesn't have a voice, uh, but it does make a sound. Remember in Acts chapter 2, there, there came a, a suddenly from the, from the heavens a sound as of a rushing mighty wind, a phone, not a voice, but a sound. 
And so I think that when you put all those things together, what you have is they heard a sound, but they didn't actually hear the voice itself. They knew something was going on, but they didn't know it was Jesus Christ, and they didn't know it was His voice, and they didn't understand the conversation, at least the words of Christ, that He was having with Paul. Now, I know there are other explanations. I think it's interesting in Acts 24 and, or 26 and verse 14 that Paul says that Christ spake to him in the Hebrew tongue. And it may just simply be that these guys with him didn't know Hebrew. And so they heard the voice, but yet they didn't really hear the voice, did they? You know, you could speak to me. If you speak Russian today, you could come up to me and you could speak to me and you could say, did you hear my voice? And I would say, yeah, I heard you. But did you hear what I said? I don't have a clue what you said. I don't understand Russian. So that may have been the, the implication. Now, the point that I want to make is this. Distinctive preaching digs deeper into the Scripture. Because there are no contradictions in God's Word. There are no, this verse says this, and it doesn't agree with this verse over here. This verse teaches this, and there's no way that, that this verse over here can be teaching that, and they can be compatible with one another. There is no feuds when it comes to the Scripture and how it works together. True preaching is distinctive in that. The second thing that I want to emphasize is uh, true preaching is full. And by that, I simply mean it includes uh, everything that God has to say. It includes all the info. It includes the whole counsel of God. And that's, in preaching, that's sometimes a difficult thing to do. Because what that means to do is sometimes you have to preach some really hard things in the Bible. Some things that I find fearful. One of the, the most fearful Bible subjects to me, maybe the most fearful, I don't know, but one of the most fearful is the subject of hell. And when you start reading about what the Bible says about, about hell, man, it, makes, it scares me to death. And of all the things that the Bible says, you know, there are a lot of fearful things that we could look at and I could point to today. But of all the things that the Bible says about hell, to me the scariest thing is its duration. In Matthew 25 and verse 46, remember Jesus said, these shall go away into everlasting punishment and the righteous into life eternal. There are so many people today and there are many pulpits today that don't like to preach on the subject of hell. And if they do preach on the subject of hell, then they like to water it down. And so maybe they, one of the things that, that you hear in the religious world today is, maybe eternal hell isn't really eternal. Maybe everlasting punishment isn't really everlasting. You know, there's an idiom, a, a Greek idiom that's used to translate forever, and it literally says under the ages of, an, of the ages. That's what it is. It's translated as forever because it means unto age, unto age, unto age, unto age, unto age. Forever. That's the idea. But there are people who use that and say, well, an age is a period of time, right? And so if, if it's a period of time, then that means that one day, hell is going to end. It's not going to be everlasting. Some people have decided, well, we'll just teach the idea of annihilation. You know, uh, yeah, there's going to be hell. Yes, a person is going to be punished. But it's not going to be forever because one day what God's going to do is He's just going to cause these people to cease to exist. That's going to be the end of their life. Friends, let me emphasize to you, if that's what the Bible teaches on the subject, we should embrace it with open arms. But that's not what the Bible teaches. And here's what you have to understand. We read Matthew 25 and verse 46. If you're going to say that hell is not everlasting punishment, the same Greek word that's used to describe the duration of hell in the very same passage there is used to describe the duration of heaven. So if hell is not permanent, that means heaven is not permanent either. If it means that one day hell is going to end, then it means that one day heaven is going to end. Now which is? So you can't say, well, one means eternal and forever, and the other one means for a short period of time or even an extended period of time. They're the very same Greek words that are used there. So what one means, the other has to mean. You know, you think about the punishment of hell, the things that the Bible 
tells us extreme suffering, powerless, despair. Uh, life, it, it's this idea of never-ending punishment in hell. And this is, to me, this is one of the scariest things to think about. The parable or the story of the rich man and Lazarus. Do you remember what that rich man, as he's in torment in Hades, what he wanted? He said, just give me a drop of water. Can you imagine being in so much pain and so much agony and so much suffering that one drop of water would relieve it in some way? That's hard to imagine, isn't it? But do you know what the Bible teaches us? There is no drop of water. There is not one ounce of of relief in hell. Ten million years from the time a person goes in there, ten million years later, the fire is just as hot. The pain is just as unbearable. And so it teaches us this idea that yes, hell is real, that the punishment is real, it is eternal in nature, and it teaches us that those who do not love God and obey the gospel are going there. And that's why we preach it. It's because the Bible teaches it. Listen, if you want distinctive preaching, you've got to preach about the subject of hell. You've got to preach about the fearful things that we find in the pages of God's Word. But you also get to preach about the favorable things. And that kind of makes it easier, I think, at least for me as a preacher. Because we get to talk about the flip side of the coin. We get to talk about that great eternal place that God has prepared for them, that love Him and that obey the gospel of Christ that we know as heaven. One of the most beautiful descriptions that's given about that place is found in Revelation 21 and verse 4. And it says, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Can you imagine living in a place where nothing dies? That's hard to imagine because we... In our physical world, on a day-to-day -day basis, we witness death. Sometimes it's just plant life. Sometimes it's animal life. Sometimes it's human life. But we live in a reality where death is prevalent. Heaven is a place where there is no death. There is no sorrow. You're not going to be sad anytime for any reason. There is no crying. You're not going to be crying. Tears aren't going to be falling down from your eyes. You're not going to be screaming out in pain and agony because there is no pain. In 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 14, this is one of the most comforting things that I, I find about heaven too, but remember there that, that Paul says that if we believe that Jesus died and rose from the dead, then we will believe that God will bring all those who have fallen asleep in Christ with Him. Imagine that joyful day. To see our loved ones again. Yeah. We get to preach about the favorable things that are pleasant. But if you're going to preach, if you're going to have true preaching and not false true preaching, you got to preach about both those things. you got to preach about the fearful things. you got to preach about the favorable things, and distinct preaching will do that. The third thing that I want to emphasize is that true preaching does not revolve around the fleshly. One of the first things that comes to my mind is truth is not going to be determined by what man finds fashionable. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew 7, 13 and 14? He said, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth unto destruction, and many there be which go in thereat, because straight in the gate is the gate, and narrow is the way that leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. What does the Bible teach us about numbers when it comes to those who are lost and those who are saved. It teaches us this, very simply, the majority of mankind will be lost. I don't say that because it brings me joy. I say it because that's what our Savior said. He said the gate is wide, the, 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 the way is broad, and many are going to go down that road compared to the few that will walk down the road that leads to salvation. And what I want to emphasize to you is just because the majority of mankind chooses to walk a certain way, is that going to change what is right and what is wrong? No. Jesus didn't say because the majority of mankind is going to choose this way, we're going to make it the way of salvation. 
And because only a few are going to choose to do it this way, we'll make that the way of destruction. No, the Bible teaches us that the majority of mankind will be lost. You remember Jesus in John chapter 6? He was teaching some hard things to His disciples. Hard sayings, the Bible says. And remember what happens in verse 66. It says, from that time, many, many of His disciples turned back and walked no more with Him. And then Jesus said, I'm sorry I offended you. You know what? Let's change our teaching, right? Let's, let's change what I said was right and make that wrong, and then let's change what I said was wrong and make that right, because I don't want a lot of people to be lost. I want you guys to stay here. What did the majority of the people do? They walked away from Christ, didn't they? They walked away from His teaching. Did not change in one bit what Jesus preached did not change his doctrine just because many people would not accept and follow what he had to say. In fact, instead, he, he kind of turns to the faithful and he said, you guys want to go walk away too? <laughs> That's real comforting, isn't it? No, Peter says, we don't have anywhere to walk. Where would we go? We can't walk away from truth and salvation and eternal life. Those things are important to us. In Exodus chapter 23 and verse 2, an Old Testament principle, thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil. Following a multitude into doing something evil does not suddenly make what they're doing right. I remember as children, sometimes we would do some things that uh, our, mother, our mother and our father would disapprove of. And they would say, son, why did you do that? And I said, well, everybody else was doing it. Does that make it right? Does that make it the good thing to do because everybody else is doing? Listen, if, if the majority of a crowd, if a multitude does what is wrong, and I join in with the multitude, I do what's wrong too. It doesn't suddenly become right. So it doesn't matter who or how many people like or dislike what we're preaching here because true preaching doesn't revolve around what the majority likes and doesn't like. Another idea under the, the point of true preaching does not revolve around the fleshly is doctrine is not going to be determined by the feds. Now, I'm running out of F. Sometimes when you alliterate here, you have to be a little bit, think outside the box. And so we're talking about government. We're talking about governmental authority. What the government says is right and wrong doesn't change what the Bible says. Now, I want to emphasize this. As Christians, we should have the highest regard for governmental authority. Romans 13 and verse 1. As I, anytime I put together a lesson, I always uh, look through, I think I owe the, this, the courtesy of looking through the uh, other speaker's subjects. Because I don't want to preach on something, well, not too much anyway, on something that somebody else, that's their sole subject. And so I want to emphasize to you uh, that Brother Wayne Brewer, has, has a lesson, I think it, it's tomorrow, but he has a lesson on, it's entitled, A Distinct Respect for Civil Government. And so I'm not going to uh, go down that road. But just understand, the Bible teaches us as Christians that we should have the highest regard for governmental authority because it's been created by God. That's why we should have respect for it. It's been established by God to maintain order, to punish those who do evil, to reward those who, who do good. And so it, we have to understand why government was created. But let me also emphasize this to you. Even though God created government, He did not create it for the purpose of telling us what is right and what is wrong. That's not governmental role. And so we need to understand that God is the one who has the right and the authority and God alone to tell us what is right and what is wrong. Remember in Acts chapter 4, you read a story about uh, the early apostles and the situation where they were called before the Jewish Sanhedrin Council. And remember what they told them in verses 18 through 20? They commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus Christ. But Peter and John say this, they say, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than God, you be the judge of that. Okay? Can you imagine standing before government and they said hey you cannot do this we're telling you we're forbidding you to do this and here's what peter and john said ah here's what you say here's what god said which one do you think we should listen to <laughs> you know if god tells you to 
uh, you know, he, he gives you a paper and has some Bible questions on that, and he says, I want you to use black ink when you fill out that paper. And then the government says to me, I think we want you to use red ink or we're not going to accept it. Well, who should I listen to? It was a, it was a no-brainer, wasn't it? Always we should listen to what God has to say. Governmental authority has no right to change what God has said. They have no right to, to make right into wrong or wrong into right. God has not given that, them that authority. That is not their role. You remember in Acts chapter 5, these apostles eventually wind up in prison. God sets them free. Uh, whenever they go to bring them out of the prison, they're gone. They can't figure it out, you know. They said, we came in, the doors were shut, everything was locked, but those guys aren't there. And then somebody comes running in and they say, these guys are right back where they were saying the very same things that they said before. And so in Acts chapter 5, they call them back in before them and they say this in verse 28, Did not we straightly command you that you should not teach in this name? Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. They didn't change their message because governmental authorities wanted them to. They didn't change their message because governmental authorities commanded them to. Distinct preaching is not going to be determined by what the government wants us to say is right and what they want us to say is wrong. The third thing under this point, I was going to change this because I changed it a little bit around this morning. Didn't like the idea of fright, but what I changed it to on, on my lesson was forewarning doesn't shut up our mouths. And when I say forewarning, what I mean is threatening. You'll read in the Bible about some people who were threatened. In fact, we just read a story about some. This is what's going to happen to you if you keep on saying these things. I think about the, the story of John the Baptist in Mark 6 and verses 17 and 18. Remember that John had been laid hold on. He had bound, been bound and put into prison for Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. And John had said unto Herod, why did he get put in prison? Because he told Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. I don't know if Herod threatened him before or not. But could you imagine if he did? What if, what if he told John, now listen, when my wife comes, I don't want you talking about our marriage, right? And if you do talk about our marriage, then I'm going to arrest you. And I'm going to put you into prison. I don't know if that happened beforehand or not. I just know that John told him what he needed to hear. But do you think it would have changed what John said, if, even if he had told him that? Threatening wasn't going to change what John was preaching. In John chapter 19 and verses 10 and 11, remember as Jesus is standing before Pilate, Pilate threatens him with the idea, he says, don't you know that I have the power to crucify you and I have the power to set you free? Was Jesus intimidated? Absolutely not. The threats of Pilate did not mean anything to him. We're told in Matthew 10 and verse 28, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Are there forces in the world today that can kill our bodies? Yes, there are. But you know what they can't kill? Our soul. Our spiritual salvation. So many things in our world today revolve around the fleshly. But the only power that people have here upon this earth is power over our fleshly body. They don't have power over our spirits. There is nothing that these people could say. There is nothing that they could do that will determine where our soul spends eternity. But Jesus did say this, there is somebody who can do that. And so we don't need to be afraid of those who can just kill our physical body but can't do anything to our souls. We need to be afraid of the one who can kill our bodies and can do something with our souls. And that's God. But just because somebody might threaten us, it should not cause us to keep from speaking the truth. And so true preaching is distinctive in that nature. The last thing that I want you to think about is true preaching is forceful but it's not forcible. And what I mean by that is preaching is something that is to be done firmly. And when I say firmly, I mean with authority. Remember that, that the, the people when they heard the teaching of Christ, 
what was so amazing to them. In Mark 1 and verse 22, it says, They were astonished at His doctrine, for He taught them as one that had authority, and not as the scribes. You read about these scribes during the day of Jesus. They were these religious experts and teachers of the law of God. And what did they spend all their time talking about and teaching the people? Well, they talked about empty disputing, you know, fighting over empty things, vain traditions of men, genealogies, that's what they wanted to talk about, loopholes in the law of God, that was their specialty, right? They weren't teaching them good and meaningful and purposeful things in life. And then you have Jesus who shows up on this scene and He's teaching them so openly. He's teaching them plainly and He's teaching them useful and practical information that is going to help them to develop spiritually. And that's what we need when it comes to the pulpits of our Lord's church today. We don't need these mindless disputes. We don't need these traditions of men. We don't need these loopholes in the law. Those things aren't going to get us anywhere. We need things that are practical in application that are going to help us develop spiritually. And the only way that those things are going to be spoken is if we speak as the oracles of God. That's what Peter told us to do in 1 Peter 4 and verse 11. That doesn't mean that you can't ever talk about matters of opinion. It doesn't mean that, that matters of expediency shouldn't be discussed or, or Christian liberties. It just means this. When God says something, then we need to stick with what God said. I think too many times we, we read things in the Bible or even as a preacher, you know, I'll preach on something and we'll, we'll study about something that God said and people will come up to me after the sermon, Christians, They'll say, well, I know God said that, but I think this. If any man speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. You want something good and useful and profitable? Tell me what God said. Not what you think. Not what you feel. Not what you believe. Can we discuss that? Sure, we can discuss that. But if God said something, we're going to talk about what God said. And we're going to stick with it. And so preaching is done firmly. And the last thing that I'll emphasize is People are not forced to accept or obey the truth. Even though we know that what we preach is indeed the will and the Word of God, we do not force men to accept it. We cannot. And that's the way God has always operated with mankind. It's the free moral agency of mankind. God tells men how it is. They have to choose whether they're going to accept it and believe it and obey it or not. You read about that in Romans chapter 1. Remember the Gentile world? In verse 20 it says, The invisible things of Him from the creation of the world, notice this, are clearly, are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. You think about clearly seen. What does that mean? That means the truth was obvious. And that means the latter part of that verse, they are without excuse. There was no reason, absolutely none, for them missing what God said and the truth of what was taught to them. Except they wanted to miss it. They didn't want to know what God said. They didn't want to follow His Word. They didn't want to see. They wanted to do what they wanted to do. They wanted to believe what they wanted to believe. And you know what God said? Romans chapter 1. You want to do this? Do it. You want to practice homosexuality? Practice it. You want to become vain in the way that you think? Think empty and vain things. And so God let them do what they wanted to do. I'm going to end with this passage in 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 10-12. through 12, And Brent brought it up last night in his lesson. But there he, uh, Paul talks about you know, those people who are, to, who are going to be deceived. And then he tells us why. He says, because they received not a love of the truth that they might be saved. And then in verse 11 he says, And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. You see, here's what this principle teaches us. God gives us the truth. God presents the truth to us. But if we don't want the truth, if we don't have a love to know what is right, what God wants from us, what He has revealed to us, if we want to believe a lie, is God going to force us to accept and obey the truth? He's not. 
God will allow us to believe what we want to believe. God will allow us to, to walk the path that we want to walk down. He isn't going to force us to accept the truth. He isn't going to force us to obey the gospel of Christ. He's going to let us do what we want to do. And that's what true preaching, distinctive preaching does too. It puts down the evidence. It lays out the facts. It presents the truth. But it does not force people to accept it. It does not force people to obey the gospel of Christ. True preaching is distinctive. It's different from all other preaching that's being done today. And what we looked at were just a few of the ways that true preaching is different or distinct. Do I need to offer an invitation or are we good? Okay, appreciate the time and the opportunity, brother.